Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. A generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. When was the last time that you, like, took a stroll through an American city's downtown? Well, in April, I was in Chicago, and I actually went around downtown Chicago with the specific ambition of diagnosing what was going on in downtown Chicago. That's Slate's Henry Grabar. He writes about cities and infrastructure, and he used to live in Chicago. But this story is not about his time as a resident. It's about something happening in American downtowns right now, a kind of hollowing out, one that has left office vacancy rates higher than they've been in decades. Henry's walk in Chicago is just the start of our story. It was the kind of aimless walk that you take. I, I feel like you only take as a reporter where you're like, <laughs> all right, I'm just going gonna, gonna to get to the bottom of this and chat with some people. What did it look like? Well, <laughs> I, I went twice. And, and the first day, it was absolutely beautiful spring day in Chicago. The tulips on uh Michigan Avenue were um, just in uh, full bloom and it was gorgeous and it felt like there was plenty of street life. And then the second day was kind of like windy and rainy and it was pretty empty. And I walked into one of the troubled malls there in uh, in downtown Chicago, Water Tower Place, which has lost a bunch of its um, big tenants. The vacancy rate was rising before the pandemic, but climbed much faster once COVID-19 struck. It's now more than 26% in Chicago's loop and also on the rise in the Michigan Avenue corridor. The mall Henry had wandered into forms the base of a skyscraper. The Macy's in it had closed. So had the food hall, the Gap, and the Banana Republic. And on the fourth floor of Water Tower Place, I found this guy who was putting on, preparing to put on Chicago Fashion Week. And I just thought, why are you doing this on the fourth floor of this rundown mall? And he was saying, well, it was an easy, cheap space and everybody knows where it is and all that. And I was just thinking, man, like, what a loss for the city of Chicago that this truly only in Chicago event, like local designers, trans models, like this is the kind of stuff you don't get in the suburbs, is happening on the fourth floor of this kind of uh, abandoned mall rather than uh, out where everybody can see it uh, in some storefront of Michigan Avenue. But of course, it's not just Michigan Avenue and it's not just Chicago. Remote work is cutting the value of New York City office space in half. We turn now to San Francisco, a major mall downtown pulling out of the city, citing sharply declining sales, fewer shoppers and more. And it the city has seen the exit of more than a dozen national retailers from downtown since just the start of the year. Cities around the U.S. are grappling with a serious problem. Those skyscrapers that were once at the heart of downtowns are nowhere near full. Today on the show, how the most prosaic symbol of work, the office building, is a symptom of a larger problem and might be hiding a coming financial crisis. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. 
Whether you're driving, cooking, or doing laundry, Progressive knows the podcasts you listen to go best when they're bundled with another activity, much like how their Progressive home and auto policies go best when they're bundled. Having these two policies together makes taking care of your insurance easier and could help you save, too. Customers who save by switching their home and car insurance to Progressive save nearly $800 on average. That's a whole lot of savings and protection for your favorite podcast listening activities, like going on a road trip, cooking dinner, and even hitting the gym. Yep, your home and your car are even easier to protect when you bundle your insurance together. Find your perfect combo. Get a home and car insurance quote at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. This episode is brought to you by Google. Cyber attacks on critical infrastructure threaten essential services. That's why public institutions like schools, hospitals, and government agencies across the country are partnering with Google to keep their data safe and secure. Because when organizations run on Google Cloud, they're defended by the same AI-powered security that protects all of Google. Explore how Google is keeping more Americans safe online. Visit safety.google forward slash cybersecurity today. I wanted Henry to try to put his walk through Chicago into numbers, to paint a picture in data of what is happening to American downtowns. I think the the number that probably gets to it best is the fact that the commercial vacancy rates for downtown offices are between 20 and 30 percent in most major U.S. downtowns. That's just in terms of leasing, right? That's just how much space is empty. That doesn't even include offices like Slate's, where it's on the books uh, as a lease, but in reality, there may not be more than a few dozen people there every day. What was it like pre-pandemic? Like, is there a comparison number? A lot of cities were under 10%. I want to say New York during the last recession peaked in the uh, in somewhere in the teens. And now, as I was saying, we're up like closer to 30. So this is pretty unprecedented. And it's led, obviously, to a whole host of uh, knock-on effects in the related economy, which is to say, uh, first and foremost, the businesses that work with the office workers, so downtown lunch spots, shoe repair, fancy restaurants where people go on client meetings, all that stuff is is suffering. Mass transit, obviously, has been a uh, a casualty of, of this trend. Um, a lot of commuter rail services like BART in San Francisco have seen their ridership totals fall pretty significantly since the start of the pandemic, and, and they haven't really come back. And then finally, I guess, would be the cities themselves, where if they don't figure out a way to get these downtown offices full again, at some point in the next few years, they're going to have to reassess all this commercial property, and the value is going to be way lower than what it was in 2018, 2019. And that's going to have a serious consequence for city tax rolls. So that's where I really want to dig in, because I think your average person might walk by an office building, right? And just think of it as a building and not necessarily something that is owned or leased or subleased, that there are all of these financial agreements in the background. And I I wonder if you could explain what's going on there and why it's so kind of feels so fragile right now. Every time I write about this subject, I get all these people yelling at me on social media <laughs> saying basically, oh, boo-hoo, down, the downtown office owners are are losing their shirts. And, and now I'm supposed to like ditch my comfy work from home situation to like save their assets? I don't think so. It's like, all right, I get it. I, I don't think that the strategy of the early pandemic, which was mayors like Eric Adams in New York, famously telling people to get out of their pajamas and basically come back to work for the good of the city, that's not going to work. Nobody's going to come back to work because they're concerned about city tax rules and they um, they want to do their part by uh, by taking a shift at a desk for for 10 hours a day. But that said, I think if you live in a city, you you do have to be concerned about what's happening here. Offices make up about 20% of the property tax rolls in New York City. So if office values plummet by a significant amount, then that's going to have knock-on effects on the city budget. And that's to say nothing of 
the second order effects we were talking about, where in many of these downtowns, employment hasn't come back to where it was before. And so that has a more direct consequence, right? Like anybody who's been working in downtown office buildings, anything that any part of that secondary economy, they're dealing also with a, a part of the economy that hasn't bounced back, even as in the suburbs, obviously, uh, the economy has 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 come roaring back and, and everything's going great. So the situation in cities right now is you go bankrupt slowly and then all at once. And I think cities are right now in the slowly phase of that. <laughs> and it may not come to at once, but what's happening right now is that there's this there's this weird standoff between um the the banks and uh, who have lent money to uh, commercial landlords to buy these big office buildings and the commercial owners of these big office buildings um, and the cities themselves. And, and right now, a lot of that property is still assessed at the value that it was in 2019. And in fact, the buildings aren't as empty and the rents aren't as low as you might expect, given how empty the streets are. Now, why is that? It's because office leases are really long. They tend to be 10 years long. And so even though demand has dropped a lot for downtown office space, there are many, many companies that are still holding on to leases they signed in 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And as a result, um, the owners of those downtown office towers aren't that desperate yet to unload those assets. That said, the values have just gone through the floor. In Los Angeles, I got this from Bloomberg, uh, office towers have, on average, $230 in debt per square foot. And the only building to sell this year sold for $154 per square foot, wow. which is to say almost all of these downtown office towers are underwater, which is to say they owe more money. The owners owe more money to the bank than the actual building is worth. And so that creates a situation where owners, you know, they're going to stick around. But at a certain point, if the bank says, you know, we need more money from you. They're just going to walk away. And that's what's happening. I mean, this is, I think, the the accessible example is not unlike the subprime housing crisis. If you, you know, had an interest rate on your home, that reset, and suddenly you owed a whole lot more than your home was worth, people were willing to walk. Why is this different? Like, are, are commercial owners less likely to walk away and just say, here, bank, you own this skyscraper now. I'm glad you mentioned interest rates, Lizzie, because that is <laughs> one thing that is happening now um, that is exacerbating the question of uh, downtown's viability. Because a lot of these places, um, they have loans on them. And if they want to refinance their loans, suddenly they're looking at these much higher interest rates. And, and that is true also of selling the buildings, right? If they want to find a new buyer, the real cost for the new buyer um, is exacerbated by by the high cost of interest rates. Um, but to get to your question, what makes this different from, from last time and what makes commercial owners different from residential owners? I think in the financial crisis, there was an understanding that there was a value of the underlying asset and that, yes, people had uh, paid too much for uh, their houses in the exurbs of Tampa and Las Vegas. But at the end of the day, a house was a house, and uh, at some point, somebody was going to want to live in it. And even though the owners couldn't afford to keep up with their um, adjustable rate mortgages, when the banks took those houses over and put them up for auction, they all got swooped up by these savvy Wall Street investors who assembled these portfolio of houses that they were pretty soon able to turn into profitable rental assets. And so the question was really just one of pricing rather than of the value of the underlying asset. And I think when it comes to downtown office towers, the situation is a bit different because it's just not clear these things in some cases are worth anything anymore um, because we just don't know how much demand is out there uh, for downtown office buildings right now. Because people may never come back to the office or never come back in the way they were in 2018, 2019. Well, maybe some people come back, but maybe the people who come back, um, they engage in what, you know, these downtown analysts are calling the flight to quality. And they decide if we're going to have downtown office space, it better be prime space in a perfect location in a brand new building with all the amenities we want. And so hmm. for the older buildings, the buildings from the 70s and 60s um, that, you know, were kind of getting by uh, with these tenants that that you know, we're kind of budget tenants respective to the, the broader downtown office market, um, they might find that they're just simply 
are not clients around who want to take on that space. And of course, there are costs of running an office building as well. So it's not just a question of can I find somebody to 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 buy this, you know, to rent this space for me for a dollar or two dollars. It has to, you have to be making a certain amount of money to make the whole thing worth it. And what we've seen in the last couple of months is um, some commercial landlords just simply walking away from their buildings and saying to the bank, you know what, it's your problem now. Huh. Uh, and and basically saying, you know, for us as a commercial landlord, the, the, the reputational risk of of default, of, of walking away from this loan is worth it to us because we think that the value of this thing is that much lower um, than the amount of money that we currently owe. When we come back, why empty offices suck money out of cities. Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis Diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis Financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. A generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis Financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. A generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis Financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. A generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. There is a scenario where these empty offices lead to a cascade of negative consequences for cities and the people who live in them. It's something called the doom loop, a term coined by NYU professor Arpit Gupta. His argument is basically that as the uh, value of these commercial assets in big downtowns declines, it's going to have an effect on city tax rules, first through uh, declining property tax revenues, but also because of declining um, sales tax revenues from all the associated business that that that's tied into that downtown economy. And as that city revenue declines, the city is in turn going to cut back on services like policing, hmm. like mass transit, like trash pickup. And, and as those services get cut, downtown will become still a less attractive place to do business. 
and and revenues will fall further and and so on and so on in this cycle between private sector disinvestment and public sector disinvestment. That sounds scary. Um, is it likely to happen? I think on a small scale, it is happening. I think you are seeing situations in which declining revenues are being met by uh, cities and um, uh, transit agencies in particular deciding that they need to cut back service in order to um, accommodate the new normal as it as it concerns their uh, their their financial balance sheets. And let's talk about the transit agency case first, because I think transit agencies, um, even more than cities themselves, have long been very, very dependent on downtown commuters. Yeah. And as downtown dries up, transit agencies find themselves having lost, in many cases, their most reliable and most lucrative ridership, paying those peak fares and piling in five days a week. And their response to this has been, all right, well, where can we look to cut service? And as you cut service, you find that people are still less likely to ride because obviously the service is getting worse and worse. And in addition to that, you know, a lot of the disincentives to take a car have gone away because there's fewer people downtown. So it might be easier to find a place to park, less traffic and, and so on. And I think with transit agencies, you know, that, that it's, it really, it really is tragic to see because they've been so focused on this downtown commuter market that as uh, the downtown commuters stop coming, they, they're, they're not really positioned to think of themselves as offering a more holistic service to a car-free city. I mean, they've really for years been focused on the nine to five uh, white collar workforce, and they absolutely need to break out of that pattern um, if they're going to survive this. And unfortunately, uh, for now, it seems that one of their one of their big reactions has been, all right, well, let's just cut service uh, until the riders come back. Well, I've got some bad news for you. If you cut the service, the riders aren't going to come back. You know, listening to you describe all of these things and reading your work on it, it it made me wonder if this is a uniquely American phenomenon, sort of central to the way the U.S. builds or has built cities, right? You have these downtowns that are hubs of commercial activity and then a lot of suburban bedroom communities. Is this happening elsewhere or, or, or is it really an American thing? Well, for reasons that are a little hard to explain, um, the remote work phenomenon has not been as dominant in cities in Europe and East Asia. And I, I can't really say why that is, but I was just reading this morning about how Singapore's office market is thriving. Um, and whether that has to do with smaller apartments or easier commutes or poor internet connections at home, I, I really, I really don't know. But one way or another, it does seem like this is happening first and foremost in America, and maybe to a lesser extent in the rest of the Anglosphere. I know London is is having some um, remote work issues as well. And in fact, uh, HSBC just decided they're going to move their headquarters from Canary Wharf, uh, which is the sort of big 80s office development um, several miles from central London, uh, to a smaller space in a more central location. And that represents the kind of flight to quality um, hmm that I was talking about that would characterize the return to office as it happens or if it happens, which is um, office holders deciding that they want smaller, better spaces instead of bigger ones in in worse locations. But I agree with you um, that America is uniquely uh, positioned to suffer from this. And that's because America has this very inequitable municipal funding structure where We have these cities that are highly fragmented and highly dependent on local revenues. And over the course of the 20th century, suburbanization has taken most of the high net worth taxpayers out of the city and put them in a different pool where their um, their money pays for local services in their suburbs instead of in the city. And then the cities uh, suffer from that disinvestment and try to make ends meet and serve the needs of an increasingly low income population that's more dependent on public services, even as the money for those services uh, flees to the suburbs. And our offices actually have functioned essentially over the last 50 years as an engine of redistribution, because there are a way for the city to draw in those suburban commuters and force them um, to spend at least some of their time and some of their money in the city, which goes to the city in the form of sales taxes, but also um, because it keeps those uh, downtown property values high. 
Right. So they're capturing some of that revenue. Right. They're capturing some of that suburban wealth in the form of this downtown office commute. And as that downtown office commute disappears and those suburbanites spend more and more time in in, in their homes, I think you are looking at a metro area that's b- going to become more fragmented and more unequal. And not just in terms of municipal revenue, but also in terms of I don't know, just something as simple as shared spaces, because I think downtowns, whether in the form of mass transit facilities or sports stadiums or simply busy sidewalks, were a place where people from different parts of the metro area would cross paths and rub shoulders and get a sense of really what their home looked like in, in a more comprehensive way. And that is disappearing as people decide to spend more and more time in their own neighborhoods. It sounds a little bit like a rerun of White Flight. I suppose it is in some sense. And I think one thing that's changed, obviously, is that (laughs) cities have simultaneously become very expensive at a residential level. So (laughs) as far as the city finances are concerned, that's the that's the kind of red escape button. Right. I mean, is that in many cities like L.A., uh, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, there is this kind of enormous pent up residential demand. So while the commercial sector may be suffering, they they do have an opportunity here, should they choose it, to uh, to unleash all this uh, spending, new tax dollars, et cetera, by allowing more people to live in the city. But whether they choose to do that or not is politically a pretty complicated question. All right. So you're bringing me to the why not just take all of that space and make it into housing question. I think there was a lot of optimism about this at the start of the pandemic, and it seems so easy and and not just intuitively because it's like empty building for a purpose that nobody wants anymore. Let's turn it into something that everybody needs, uh, which is housing, of course. And we have a very severe housing affordability crisis in this country, and it's worse than it has been in decades. Not only that, for decades, there has been a trend of taking old downtown office space and converting it into residential space. Now, we've seen this in downtown Chicago and downtown L.A. We saw it in Soho and New York, maybe first and then later in the financial district. But the problem is that works really well with early 20th century buildings um, that uh, have basically lost their utility as office spaces and make a relatively easy renovation into residential space because they have these small floor plates, they have windows that open, they have lots of light and air because they were designed for a time before air conditioning, uh, et cetera. Now, the type of office stock that we're dealing with now is, is, is totally different, right? Like we've sort of run out of those old uh, 20th century, early 20th century buildings. And now we're dealing with the post-war generation of office buildings that have really wide floor plates. They have windows that don't open and they're huge. They're just gigantic. And hmm. um, they're just really, really challenging to convert on an architectural level. Like it just takes a lot of money um, to do those renovations. And in some cases, I've been told that renovating one of those buildings um, to get it ready for a housing conversion can cost about as much as just building an apartment building from the ground up. So that shows you the challenge of making these transformations happen until the value of the office tower drops to virtually nothing. It's going to be really, really hard uh, for somebody to just buy that building and convert it. It's not just landlords and property managers struggling with what to do with empty offices. Cities are right there with them. Every mayor says the same thing about converting office to residential and uh, getting people back downtown and getting people out of their pajamas and and all that stuff. But there hasn't really been that much success. And I think one place where that's maybe most evident is in this question of converting offices to housing, right? I mean, or or just building housing at all, because this is the the place where, again, Cities have this opportunity because there is all this pent up demand and housing right, remains people very People want expensive. to live there. People want to live there. And so despite all this talk about the doom loop, I mean, there is this massive exception to that, which is there's clearly enormous demand for housing in cities. And yet um, many cities, the land use rules remain so restrictive that it's really, really challenging to build new housing on an empty lot to say nothing of undertaking a very complicated uh, office to residential conversion. Okay, what if we just let them fail? Let the let the 
big office buildings fail, banks take them over. What then? I think there's three potential problems with that. One is you're giving up on um, the secondary services that rely on those offices. And banks are notoriously bad property managers. They're not interested in scrounging around for some pop-up tenant that's going to occupy the space for six months or whatever. But from a city perspective, you really don't want that building to be empty um, because an empty building means empty sidewalks around it. It means fewer customers for the neighboring shops and stores. It means fewer people riding mass transit, et cetera. Um, so the idea of these buildings being mothballed is, is bad for the urban environment around the buildings. It's also bad um, for city tax rolls because if the value of the building um, gets reassessed based on the fact that nobody thinks it's worth anything, um, then that's going to reduce its tax burden. And in the case of the city, it's not a burden at all. It's actually a, a very important source of revenue that they'll be losing. And then the third thing, perhaps, is that local and regional banks will be in trouble <laughs> if hmm. they have to uh, assume all these losses on their commercial real estate portfolios. Because then they're they're hanging on to buildings that are worth nothing. And they go, they go bye-bye. They, they can't just write that down. They thought they had tens of billions of dollars in downtown office assets. And it turns out all those buildings are actually worth like two or three billion dollars. Like that's a pretty big write down um, that they are going to be reluctant to make. And then once they do, it's going to have all these knock-on effects in how they run the rest of their business. Now I don't I don't mean to so panic about this question. One interesting thing about commercial real estate is that while the downtown office tower is the biggest symbol perhaps of this sector, downtown office space makes up a small percentage of the country's total office space, most of which is in the suburbs, and then office space as a whole makes up a small portion of commercial real estate as a whole, which includes all kinds of other uh, uses like malls and data centers and and, and even multifamily housing. So that, all that is to say, I, I wouldn't count on a you know rerun of 2008 caused by um, abandoned downtown office towers, but it certainly won't be good uh, for the downtown neighborhood or, or for the city. Are there bright spots or ideas about sort of fixing this cluster of economies? short of, you know, completely changing the the way cities are built and municipal tax revenue is collected. I think the idea that gives me the most optimism is the idea that for a long time, cities have designed their economies around creating as many incentives for white collar office relocations and they've been competing for these firms and they've been adjusting their mix of taxes and services to best cater basically to corporate executives to try and get them to relocate their offices but that line of thinking that competing uh, offering competing incentives to try and lure you know the next Amazon HQ2 that's out the window now because there's no guarantee that getting the corporate HQ comes with any of the employees <laughs> who are going to, you know, invest in the housing stock and spend their money and hire nannies and all that stuff. So to me, this hints at a new urban paradigm where cities are actually more focused simply on the people who live there and maybe on more basic functions of city government, which are providing good services and making sure that the people who live in the city are getting what they need. And I think that is the kind of reallocation of resources that is going to be essential if cities are going to maintain their status as attractive places to live going forward. Because going forward, they're actually not going to be competing for offices at all. They're simply going to be competing for the workers more directly. And um, that's a frightening change. And in the short run, it might be painful. But in the long run, it probably equates to an urban policy that is more closely aligned with the needs of residents than what we've seen for the last few decades. Henry Gabar, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. Thanks for having me. Henry Grabar covers cities, architecture, and the environment for sleep. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Mia Armstrong-Lopez. 
Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family. And we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you like what we are doing here, the very best way to support us is by becoming a Slate Plus member. Just go to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up and you'll get all your Slate podcasts ad free. All right, we will be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening. Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. Our generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Diamond for diamond, no one compares with Mervis. At Mervis Diamond Importers, our natural diamonds come straight from the mines in Africa and our mermaid lab-grown diamonds beat all others for quality and value. Come view our brilliant diamonds, both natural and lab-grown. Mervis diamonds are so bright and full of fire, they will blow you away. So will the affordable prices. Our diamonds may steal your heart, but not your wallet. See our mermaid lab-grown diamonds and learn how to get a larger diamond for less. You can get a bigger mermaid lab-grown diamonds than you ever thought possible. And with Mervis financing, you can enjoy up to five years to pay with zero interest. Our generous full-value trader policy and our lifetime warranty program easily make Mervis your first choice. When you mount a world-class Mervis diamond into a designer ring from our huge collection, there is no equal. Mervis Diamond Importers. For an appointment, call 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com. Again, that's 800-HER-LOVE or go to MervisDiamond.com.